The Gulf Injustice Podcast, the official podcast of Detained in Dubai with Prada Stern. Welcome to the Gulf Injustice podcast. I'm Rada Sterling and today we're going to be discussing a case that has potentially huge ramifications for all of us and it's the case of British national Christopher Ems. Now Chris is a crypto expert and he's a regular speaker. He's been speaking almost every other week in uh, countries across the world. He's assisted uh, foreign governments, the British government, in advising on regulatory and other uh, issues related to cryptocurrency. And he was invited by North Korea to speak there. Now, he did check with the FCDO and the British government as to whether that would be fine. And he was assured that he was in violation of no British or international laws in attending that conference. However, during a recent trip to Saudi Arabia, where he was attending another conference, he found that on his exit, he'd been listed on Interpol's database and was subject to extradition proceedings initiated by the US for violating American sanctions against North Korea, which he, of course, denies. Now, number one, his case is that he hasn't, uh, even if he were a US person, he did not actually act in any way that would have violated those sanctions. But number two, that he's not even subject to the laws of America. Can you imagine if another country like Saudi tried to extradite an American citizen from Britain for violating Saudi sanctions, we would be absolutely outraged. And yet, more and more, the US is requesting the extradition of non-American citizens, non-US persons, who have committed no crime in their own country and no crime under international law. We look at the case of Julian Assange and the, the risks that that extradition poses to other people in in foreign countries, other journalists. And it's the same in this situation. If we have the United States universally applying their laws in other countries, we risk that we, we are losing our sovereignty, that the laws of Britain that a British national would be subject to are actually inferior to the laws of the United States. But British citizens are not taught American law. They're not taught to follow American law. And in fact, they're told that if if they do something that's legal in the United Kingdom or legal under international law, that they would be protected. So where has this protection gone? This overreaching, bullying nation is using its political and diplomatic sway to secure the extradition of non-US persons not subject to US laws. And this is a massive violation that could have far reaching implications for foreign nationals and it puts everyone at risk. Now let's go and talk to Christopher Ems and hear his side of the story. Okay. Uh, so thanks for joining us on the Gulf and Justice podcast, Chris. It's uh, it's good to see you. And how are things in Saudi? I mean, right now, how are things going over there in Saudi? I know you've been there since uh, I think it was February now, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, things here are uh, as as expected. Um, obviously, I would much prefer to be making my way back to you know the UK or onwards yes. to an onward destination to home from here um, yes. but as far as things go in terms of the Saudi authorities I've been treated very well um, so mm. no complaints there whatsoever it would just be really nice to have have the uh, travel ban lifted so that I can get on and get on with my life really. Mm, absolutely and I understand there are diplomatic efforts from the United Kingdom to Saudi to try and make that happen and also to the United States but let's let's go back to the beginning because some of our, our listeners won't know the full story here so uh, you were you I mean tell us essentially about your background you founded a, a crypto business just tell us a little bit about that yeah so I've been involved in the cryptocurrency industry or space um, for quite a long time um probably before it was quote unquote cool <laughs> um so uh, I, I originally got into the space in 2016 um which feels like a lifetime ago in crypto um i originally worked for the first ever cryptocurrency debit card issuer which was a company called wavecrest based out of gibraltar um i left there and i built um a business called Token Key, not so long after that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Token Key was the first ever cryptocurrency business to look at how to police bad actors in the crypto space and to perform mm-hmm. um, ICOs or initial coin offerings within a regulated environment. 
And that led on to all sorts of different opportunities, finally landing me with a, a really exciting job um, where I was the, the head of business development at Bitcoin.com, which is uh, uh, the second largest cryptocurrency uh, wallet in the world. Um, and it was a really great experience being there. So that's kind of my background. So I've seen the industry come from, you know, really come to where it, where it is today. <laughs> and I, I, I mean, you were reporting directly to Roger Ver, who I understand also relinquished his uh, US citizenship and, and went abroad. Also quite an interesting story in itself. Um, but I mean, that led you to, to being a prominent speaker. You were advising governments and, and regulators on issues relating to cryptocurrency. And as I understand it, you were speaking sort of every other week or every week at international events on uh, what the latest issues. I mean, what, what was most of the content that you spoke about at these? events yeah so <clears throat> excuse me um so so yeah i was speaking pretty much all over the world you name it i was there there, there came a point sort of between 2017 to 2019 where i was on a plane more than i was off one um, i was at conferences that, that that much speaking um and the content would be you know really explaining some con some conferences would be to industry peers where the con content would be in a little more detail about the, you know, where the industry was going, what we should be looking at in terms of um, as, as an industry, mainly advocating for relations, um, you know, uh, sorry, regulation. And um, one of the, uh, the things I'm probably most famous for doing in 2017, I attended the first and spoke at the first ever ICO conference in London. Um, and I, I was pretty much a dissident in arguing that if something looked like a security i use the duck rule if it looks like a duck acts like a duck quacks like a duck it's a duck when i was arguing for securities and regulation uh, in the space and um, all the way to maybe events where people um didn't know that much about cryptocurrency where i'd go through the very basics of how a cryptocurrency transaction happened what a mm -hmm. smart contract is um, what it, what's the difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin, which were the main two currencies around that time before we've had this explosion into a lot of other different cryptocurrencies these days? Mm. And uh, I, th I think I saw one of your YouTube videos where you were speaking in Dubai as well, where you'd been, I, I think, living for a while and helping with the Abraham Accords. Uh, yeah, so that came actually after that speech. But over the past uh, few years, I've been based full time in Dubai since the back end of 2019. Um, so yeah, um, I was really, really fortunate and privileged to be, a, uh, you know, to become part of, um, you know, the, the process of the Abraham Accords. And um, being in crypto, the wonderful thing about the industry is, you know, you work with people all across the world, uh, all over the world, regardless of, you know, their, you know, political or yeah. ethnic divides or anything like that. So that, that really allowed me to work, uh, do a lot of work over the last few years um, in both Israel and the Middle East as a whole, which really positioned me perfectly living in Dubai to be able to introduce my Israeli friends to, yeah. to the UAE and to be part of um, that, that amazing transformation that's happened and that real sense of peace that you now feel in the Middle East mm. between Israel and, and Dubai, UAE, Bahrain, and even Morocco. <laughs> I mean, since since the Abraham Accords, they've done very well, the Israelis and uh, the Emiratis, especially in their mutual business arrangements and tourism and everything. And so far, so good. Um, so it's amazing that you're able to be a, a part of that. So you're in Dubai when you were invited to this uh, this cryptocurrency conference in North Korea. And I understand you checked with the FCDO, you checked with the British authorities, and there was absolutely no issue. It was a different time. You know, Trump, Pompeo, they were looking at a, a friendship or a growing alliance with that country, or at least a diffusion of the of the existing tensions. So you didn't think that it was it, much of a problem, obviously, after your investigations. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Right. Yeah, absolutely. So um, after the investigation where I, I also sent an email to the British, the, the, at the time that we were going, there was an open and active British embassy in Pyongyang, um, which is the capital of, of North Korea, um, <clears throat> sent the email um, and also checked, you know, I think one of the nice things about being British is we do have a very good government website um, that, that allows us to check you know, guidelines, bans, et cetera, on traveling to any country in the world. Um, mm. 
you know, I, I traveled to places like Armenia and places like that. So I was very familiar with checking these these things out just to check that I wasn't, you know, potentially breaking any laws. Yeah. Um, so I did that, didn't see any any issue uh, with with going. So I thought, you know, I'd, I'd go ahead and, and uh, attend. And so I understand you're invited to attend, I mean, as, as an attendee, but also as a speaker. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So, uh, so the the term that was labelled and banded around a lot has been organiser. I wouldn't say that I was exactly. An organizer in there's any there's way. been an allegation from the United uh, States yeah. that you organised the event, and just for the sake of clarity, yeah. did you organise the event? No, I didn't have any organisation. I wouldn't have had the authority to do so. That was solely reserved for uh, members of the the local North Koreans and for Mr. Kaldabenos, who is a special delegate and government representative of North Korea. So I had no, of course, would never have any authority to organise anything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you attended the conference. I understand there was a little bit of drama, which we've written about in, in previous press releases, but one of the attendees right. uh, was uh, pulled aside because, I mean, all of your technology was searched on arrival. And when they searched his technology, they found some uh, pornographic videos, as I understand it. Correct. Um, I think this is a very important um, topic that really needs to be addressed. I, I won't name the individual because um, because I don't think for legal reasons that's a good idea for one thing. Um, this individual really put the the whole group at, at significant risk. Um, so the the film was uh, he um, deliberately concealed this on his laptop. So it was it, it was very much seen by the North Korean. Uh, guides, if you like, um, as as a as a as an insult and a provocation. The mm. consequence of that is number one, his laptop was seized from him. Um, but the other consequence, which was you know severe for all of the other people involved, including myself, was our passports were then confiscated. Um, we didn't receive our passports back until um, the evening before we were due to fly out. Um, and uh, having your passport confiscated, I think, in any country um, is pretty scary, um, let alone in, in North Korea. <laughs> Absolutely, I agree with that. And I, I have had uh, people contact me in the past who've been arrested in, in Dubai, uh, even for the same reasons. And it can happen. Mm -hmm. But certainly in North Korea, it's a much uh, more frightening uh, situation to be in. And mm -hmm. from then on, Basically, there was a lot of tension within the group throughout the conference. Um, mm -hmm. So you you spoke, you delivered your speech at the event. Other other people did as well, including Virgil Griffith, who I, I think mm -hmm. most people will understand this as a US citizen who has now mm -hmm. entered a guilty plea in the United States to violating sanctions in his speech. Mm -hmm. Now, um, were, was your speech separate to Virgil's or did you speak together? No, we had separate separate speeches. Um, so I, I was speaking on something completely different than, than he was. And you didn't know Virgil before the event. This was the first time you met him. No, this is we. The first time we met was I think it was the day before, very briefly at the embassy, picking up your visa, as as, as it were. But we'd never met before, um, you know. And and I never I never met him uh, after after the conference uh, either. Um, so you, there was no sort of um, scheme so, to. <laughs> yeah. put together so, a, uh, a ruse to break sanctions it would uh, it was just not feasible if it would for me it wouldn't be a feasible thing to be able to do in great detail unless you were to meet someone yeah so this 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 was simply another attendee and there were many um okay so you delivered your speech uh, according to um uh documents there was a, a whiteboard that said something along the lines of you know this is how you violate sanctions not quite it said uh, what did it say it said um no sanctions that's all with an exclamation yeah. mark and um that was used in an allegation against you that that was actually um your part of your presentation and for clarity that was not is that uh, right correct um yeah Correct. To my, to my knowledge, uh, that that was that was actually written by by Mr. Griffith by Virgil. Um, my president, my uh, whiteboard drawings, if you like, were explaining um, a cryptocurrency transaction um, that would that could be performed 
you know, by anyone anywhere in the world. Now, um, a very important thing, which actually came out in Virgil's uh, defense memorandum, which is very important, I think, is um, one of the world's leading experts on blockchain is a man called um, Andreas Antonopoulos. Um, and he he wrote a, a very uh, um, he the prosecution in in Virgil's case um, called him a so-called crypto expert. I, I there is no doubt in my mind that he is a leading crypto expert. I mean, he said that any of the content that was either written or drawn on any whiteboard or anything spoken about because he's had access to all of that evidence that was supplied to him in discovery and um, none of it is anything that it is that would not be available to anyone through a simple google search okay so post the conference i mean it, you, you spoke for a short period of time you left uh, north korea and didn't really think about it again until such time as virgil griffith a co-attendee was arrested and he was charged with um conspiring to violate the aipa act which is basically sanctions against north korea as a u.s citizen and he was arrested in the u.s and he had originally um entered an, a, a not guilty plea or as he said innocent plea and mm -hmm. I mean that there, there is a lot of discussion about why did he change his plea at the very last minute when he seemed very intent to go ahead with that not guilty plea and there is speculation that because of a, an event that happened before um, trial um, that that would equate to essentially human rights violations that are happening within that detention facility in New York that might have sort of acted as a coercion for him to enter a guilty plea so that he could be transferred to a much nicer uh, prison situation, which is just abysmal as far as, I mean, it happens in the UAE, it happens in other countries, and we criticise it, but when it happens in the United States or Western nations, I think that's absolutely appalling. It's um, a form of coercion. It's um, you know, it's, it, it's forcing people to enter pleas of, under duress, basically. So... OK, but he has entered a guilty plea, regardless of, of what potentially led to that. And um, now you have been accused by the FBI of um, violating US sanctions against North Korea, which obviously, as you as you well know, this is not a crime in the United Kingdom. And as a British citizen, you did not commit a crime in the United Kingdom. And you've spoken to authorities, haven't you? You've, you've met up with authorities in Dubai. You've met, you know, you've telephoned the, uh, what, what was it, the National Security um, Hotline? Or? Yeah, the uh, <laughs> MI, MI6 hotline, if you like. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that was as soon as I arrived back in, in the UK from, from the trip. So you've made yourself completely available to British authorities and you've said to them, if I've committed any crime under uh, UK law, I'm willing to fight, uh, face justice. Absolutely. Um, if, if I've committed, and that's always been the case since day one, um, if, if I've committed a crime to which I believe I'm subject to as a British citizen or as an international citizen, i.e. Mm. if it is a crime under international law or under mm. uh, British law, um, or European law, if you like, um, I'd be more than happy to, if the evidence and the facts are presented to me by 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 the Crown Prosecution Service in the UK or whichever uh, mm. body it would be for which I'm subject, um, if that is the case and, and I have committed the crime, then I, I'm more than happy to hold my hands up and, and take a punishment for it. Mm. However, I'm from the vast amount of work that, that I've done over the past few years with advisors and lawyers, I'm fairly convinced that I have, I'm have i not guilty of any crime under UK or international law. Or even United States law, because, I mean, we, we've right. spoken to a number of attorneys and a number of former prosecutors mm -hmm. and uh, even, even uh, people who have worked for the Attorney General in the past, and they've said mm -hmm. that this statute that they have accused you of violating is clearly not applicable to US persons. It specifies that wording exactly, but it's never been tried. Whenever the FBI has accused someone of violating sanctions under this act, that person has simply entered a guilty plea. And again, this could be under coercion or the threat that they're going to spend 20 years to life in prison if they don't enter a guilty plea. And so the, the pressure of that, I, I believe, has caused a lot of people to unfairly enter a guilty plea. But at least those people have been 
in the US jurisdiction and territory when they have been arrested. So this is a, a peculiar uh, case in that the US is trying to extradite a British national under an act that doesn't apply to non-US citizens. And they've tried to do that in Saudi Arabia. So we've got multiple jurisdictions involved here. And what struck me as interesting is that they seem to wait for you to go to Saudi Arabia for a conference that you were attending. And at that point, activate the Interpol notice when clearly they would have known, and they did know that you were in Dubai and you were, you were right there, you were talking to British authorities. They knew that you were there. I believe, and I, I've dealt with um, uh, US extraditions from the UAE before, and they haven't been very successful. In fact, the UAE has said uh, no, or they've jailed the person in the UAE and they said, well, they've served their time. We're not going to send them back to the US for them to do additional um, prison time. And they've said no. So I believe that the US waited for you to, to go to a, a jurisdiction where you would A, feel uncomfortable, B, where they feel that there's more diplomatic pressure, C, where it might be more difficult to get legal assistance, and D, potentially where Britain has less uh, influence as well. You know, I mean, Britain obviously has a very, very strong relationship with the uh, UAE and possibly more than the United States. So maybe they just went jurisdiction shopping and chose Saudi. It means that you're staying in hotels or Airbnbs, you're away from uh, your, your life. And it's a very long and grueling process. And I think that's part of the punishment, that they want you to feel uncomfortable, that they want you to uh, have difficulty securing legal representation so that you might be intimidated into surrendering to what I believe is a wrongful and abusive extradition process. I mean, I know, I know this must be how you feel, obviously, and they've, they've also frozen your bank accounts and, and crypto accounts and everything that they possibly could without warning. And yet, I mean, how are you going to get a fair hearing? How are you going to get justice when they, they've literally put you in this position? Yeah, exactly, Rada. I think you hit the nail on the head there on, on all of the points there. Um, it, for me, looking at the, the date that the indictment was actually served, which is the 27th of January, it, it doesn't make any sense. They've had, uh, I, no, they've had uh, since 2019 to indict me uh, on this charge and then to issue um, uh, Interpol red notice. It's very, for me, it's incredibly suspect that they did it during the just under two week trip that I've taken to Saudi Arabia to uh, actually, I was in environment. Um, so this makes it even more suspect that they uh, that they decided to, uh, to to act in this way uh, at, at the point in which I was in this country. Um, so yeah, I, th I think you're very right there. Um, just maybe to give some more colour on the situation. Obviously, it's not very comfortable. Um, as you said, I'm bouncing between hotels and, <laughs> and uh, Airbnbs. Um, most of my uh, wealth has has been sort of depleted over the last number of years through you know lawyers and and dealing with 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 uh, trying to get ready to fight this and fighting it mm -hmm. um, and having all your bank accounts and even my cryptocurrency wallets um, frozen uh, I have access to very little money um, no healthcare here or anything yep. like that so it's, it's not ideal <laughs> and 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 that's without due process by the way that that is simply the FBI issued an indictment and suddenly all of your accounts are frozen all over the world and that to me is also completely unjust I mean we've spoken to um, British members of the, of the government who have said the same that this is absolutely outrageous that United States can have that sort of impact outside of their borders and I mean let's talk about universal jurisdiction and this this is one one thing that I don't think people grasp, on the one hand, you know, there is a movement to expand your universal jurisdiction in order to be able to achieve justice, as they describe it. But have they thought about the ramifications for universal jurisdiction? Have they thought of the way it infringes on other countries' sovereignty? I mean, British citizens, they... They, they go to school, they learn about British law, they don't learn about American law, and they never for one moment consider that they have to abide by US law in any way. They're not in the United States. We are absolutely taught that we have to abide by our own country's laws and any country that we visit or voluntarily enter into the jurisdiction of that country. So what happens when the United States can suddenly um, point at someone in, in Asia or in Europe and say, you violated our laws. I mean, to me, this is 
astounding. And we, I mean, we've thought about this and we've, we've strategized about universal mm -hmm. law and we've said that what would happen if Saudi Arabia had sanctions against Turkey, let's say, and a, an American citizen went to Turkey and did some business there. And then we, you know, and then Saudi tried to extradite that American citizen from Britain. I mean, we would laugh at it. We would, you know, criticize them in the media. We would just say, it's not possible. Saudi has no universal jurisdiction. And that American citizen doesn't have to abide by Saudi law. So why does a British citizen who doesn't have to abide by Saudi law or China's law or Russia's law, why do they have to abide by American law? It makes absolutely no sense. And it does violate those United Nations principles on sovereignty. If Britain says to British citizens, from now on, you have to abide by our law and American law, that's a different story. And that is something that would be so profound that there would be protests, demonstrations all over London. So how has it just been surreptitiously sort of allowed to happen by the way of, of, of the US kind of bullying countries and uh, intimidating them or just, you know, throwing their weight around? I find it absolutely unacceptable and they wouldn't even allow it from Britain. So why should Britain allow it from them? I mean, what, what's your thoughts? Obviously, I, I know what you're going to think about this, but it's it's surprising, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's it's even more surprising that, uh, you know, as as the UK, we've just gone through a process of, you know, quote unquote Brexit, mm. um, where, you know, if, if we're to hear the the uh, arguments of, of our of our government is uh, is a process about taking back control of our own laws and our own jurisdiction, sovereign mm. sovereignty. Um, what what I feel is happening here is, you know, the long the longer I'm here, the the more of a farce, quite frankly, that is becoming, um, because it it would appear now that we have replaced one set of overlords for another. Um, if a British citizen can be plucked from anywhere in the world without his government putting up a fight to get him at least home to face those charges in his in in the court. That 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 the British sub subject uh, uh, should be subject to, um, it it really concerns me. And I, I think rather we've had conversations about about this, about um, you know why why am I going why am I going out like this and being so public and wanting to to you know uh, to 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 really fight for this? It's because for me, if we don't fight this now, this is not going to end. It, it, I will be the first case. But there will be so many more that come after me that don't have a voice. Obviously, we have the very high profile people like uh, Julian Assange that we, you know, everyone, everyone who follows any of these matters on extradition is very aware of. Um, but, you know, I would I would hopefully argue that my case is very different than Julian Assange's in terms of the gravity of what we're being accused here. And that, you know, something that so the dual criminality of this. Um, mm -hmm. If the US can just pluck anyone in the world, regardless, then really they need to start teaching US law uh, in the in in British schools, because otherwise, uh, you know, anyone is going to be uh, subject to to the same kind of treatment unless we can nip it in the bud and fight this. I mean, Julian Assange is obviously the the most prominent case about universal mm -hmm. jurisdiction, but that's. You know, then then you're talking about dual criminality. I mean, the allegations against mm -hmm. you are so minuscule and trivial that I think even if you went to the United States, it would get tossed out of court. You know, there, there's really no evidence of a serious crime here or any crime. I mean, it would be outrageous. And I think that the prosecution would simply be trying to intimidate you into a guilty plea. But that aside, it's certainly not a crime in Britain. It's certainly not a crime in Saudi. So we have the dual criminality issues. We have the universal jurisdiction issues. And you're absolutely right that if we don't stop this now, the US is just going to be able to pick anyone from anyone in the world, anywhere in the world, and, and pull them back to a, you know, US prison system, which by the way, we all know the conditions there are terrible. I've spoken to US citizens, they, they would rather do prison time in the Middle East than in the US in, in some cases. So, I mean, there, there are different standards of prisons over there, and particularly the one that mm -hmm. they would want to take you to is notorious for human rights violations. Yeah. And there have been numerous yeah. studies and investigations about it as well, haven't there? Um, I mean, we'll wrap it up there because we've got to get ready for the BBC but um, um, 
I mean, yes, absolutely. Look, one of the things we're going to have to do is challenge this with the United Nations because it does need to be brought to that sort of level. We've seen Julian Assange with these issues. Yours is a, a, a trivial allegation, and yet they've still done, done this. And the, um, the other thing that I, I forgot to mention is just last week they put out a wanted poster for you, didn't they, and informed... Yeah. British authorities that they were putting out a poster and that's pure intimidation isn't it I mean it has no value none whatsoever we've made it they've been uh, the the American uh, government have been in contact with the British embassy the British embassy on my authorization informed them as if they didn't know already that I was in Saudi Arabia exactly where I am so I'm hardly wanted um, because they, um, my my understanding is you issue a wanted poster when you don't know where someone is and you want to find them in order to arrest them. Um, they know where I am. And, <laughs> I'm not, and, the, I'm and not the poster the says run. you're <laughs> at, at large believed to be in Saudi. I mean, they know full well that you're in um, Saudi. Ab- They're trying to extradite absolutely. you. <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, and and at, at large is farcical. I'd love them to come and see the, the bed sit that I'm currently living in in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> I tell you, it's not... It's not much of an at-large, on-the-run lifestyle that, that I'm living right now. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I feel also on, the, on that note that there is an increasing um, movement to persecute people in the cryptocurrency industry. And there is a new body, a, a task force founded by the Biden administration to go after people in the crypto industry. And there is a movement to secure successful convictions or guilty pleas. And they're going to get promotions out of it. So I, I think that's where the, a, a lot of this push is coming from. They just want an easy conviction or an easy target. A lot of tech people, you know, if, if they if they get the full force of the FBI, are going to be intimidated into entering a guilty plea. In this case, we are absolutely going to fight it all the way to the end. Uh, we're looking at removing the Interpol notice, which is, is abusive. And, I mean, the other thing is, in the United States, there, there is a, a, a working group that's looking to... Um, you know, stop this kind of Interpol abuse that's happening on a regular basis. But now we're, we're, we're seeing that the US is actually one of the biggest abusers, and certainly in cases like yours. Uh, so we're going to look to appeal that notice with Interpol. We're going to be looking at the United Nations for intervention. And also the British and Saudi governments need to stand up for their own sovereignty and ensure that the US doesn't have the ability to pluck foreign nationals from any country in the world. That absolutely has to stop. It's not equal. Other countries can't do it and the US should not be able to do it. This is totally against principle of sovereignty, United Nations and international law. Um, So on that note, we'll we'll, uh, leave it. But I, I also want to mention, but yes, the punishment is the process in many of these cases. And and that's with Interpol and extradition. We see that from the Middle East as well. People are spending hundreds of thousands on legal fees, legal defence, extradition lawyers, uh, Interpol removal, and and so on. And uh, and I think that at the end of it, authorities are satisfied that you've been punished by the process. And that could be what's happening here. But... um, I will leave it there and uh, lovely to talk to you and I'm sure you'll be home soon. (laughs) Let's hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Golf Injustice podcast. 